Praise God. The last two Sundays, we've talked about some of those less popular characters within the nativity story that actually missed what was happening. They missed Christmas, and we, we talked um, about some of the reasons why. The infamous innkeeper turning Mary and Joseph away was probably more accurately one of Joseph's relatives whose guest room was already occupied, a, a household full of family. How many know can create distractions uh, to a place where we ask ourselves, where are you Christmas? I mean, in the midst of all this family and all these distractions, I can't really seem to find it. Uh, we also talked about those that were stiff-necked. Everybody turn to the left, turn to the right. Prove that you're not stiff-necked this morning. Which is stubborn, rebellious, unwilling to be led. Those like King Herod the Great and the people of Jerusalem at the time, which would have been predominantly Jews, including the religious leaders, the chief priests and the scribes, the Bible makes it clear that all these people were troubled by the news from the wise men that the Savior had been born. They missed it because they were stiff-necked, troubled that the Savior they'd been waiting for for generations upon generations was now finally here, and they were troubled by that. And we get stubborn, and we don't want to be led by anyone, including the Holy Spirit. And we don't always even realize that we become this way, but it can leave us wondering, where are you Christmas? Well, this morning I want to continue talking about some of those less known individuals surrounding that first Christmas. But instead of looking at those who missed it, let's look at those that didn't miss it at all. Amen? We know the shepherds got it right, and we know the wise men figured out how special this moment in time was. But let's talk about some of those less popular individuals who absolutely recognized what was happening and never found themselves wondering, where are you Christmas? So the first person I want to talk about today is Elizabeth. Everybody say Elizabeth. She found it. She absolutely found it. She didn't miss Christmas, and it was because she had faith. Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary and the mother of Jesus. Elizabeth, in her old age, became pregnant, and she gave birth to John the Baptist, which was according to the promise that the angel Gabriel had gave her husband, uh, Zechariah, who was a priest. When Zechariah questioned Gabriel about it, Gabriel silenced him to where he wasn't able to talk until his son John was born. It's a very interesting part of the story. Zechariah is visited by Gabriel, the angel. Gabriel says, hey, your wife's going to have a son. He's like, hey, we're old. I mean, we've heard this before. It kind of reminds us of Abraham and Sarah, doesn't it? We've heard this before. And Abraham or Zechariah kind of says, uh, I don't get this at all. Are you sure? Or he questions Gabriel, and Gabriel says, you know what? You ain't going to talk for a while. How many think that that would be a gift to you if Gabriel came and closed your mouth for just a little while? Amen? How many know our mouth gets us into a lot of trouble? Try preaching every week for 40 minutes. Your mouth can get you into a lot of trouble. What, you don't, you don't relate to that? The things that come out of our mouth are important. What we choose to say, what we don't choose to say, right? So, let's jump into the scripture about Elizabeth. Luke 1, 26 through 38 says, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think about or think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive a, a, and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and, you will, and, he, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. And the angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby, will be born, uh, will, the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age, People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and now is in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Amen? Amen. 
Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So upon Mary, the mother of Jesus, receiving the news that she herself would conceive, she really went right over to Elizabeth because she found out Elizabeth um, had conceived too in her old age. And so they, there's two family members here who had something in, in common, both miracle pregnancies, right? Both miracle pregnancies, both visited by the angel Gabriel. There's some connections here that you can't miss. Luke 139.45 says this, a few days later, and that's after Gabriel met with uh, Mary, a few days later, Mary hurried to the hills country of Judea in the town where Zechariah lived, and Elizabeth, because that was her husband. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Woo! I mean, that's a woo moment, Right? Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry. I, I wondered if you would know how to do that. Can you give a glad cry this morning? Well, yeah, that, that's about right. I mean, uh, when she heard Mary's voice, the baby leapt with, leaped within Elizabeth, and she gave a glad cry. I, I think she went, whoo, whoo. So we're going we're gonna to take two seconds and we're gonna we're gonna take this this uh, little thing off here again because it's crackling again and uh maybe we'll just get rid of it forever right check we keep fixing things on it and it keeps breaking something else so anyway At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child left within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? Elizabeth knew what was going on, and the baby hadn't even been born yet. Jesus had not been born yet. When I heard your greeting, the baby in my, in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. See, Elizabeth, again, she knew right away what was going on. She had the eyes to see, and she had the ears to hear, and she had the heart to believe. She had faith, which Hebrews defines as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. She couldn't see it yet, but she believed. That, that's important. You have to put yourself in their shoes. For thousands of years, they'd been waiting for a promised Messiah. They were 400 years silent, and I'm going to get into that in a, in, in a little bit, but there was 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament where no prophet spoke. They were so ingrained in their religion, in the culture, and if you understand Jewish culture, you, you understand that they are not only a nationality, but they're a religious culture as well. And together those things, you know, for that many years, waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for that promised Savior. And now, upon seeing Mary pregnant, Elizabeth just gets it and says, that's my Savior in your belly. That's pretty unbelievable. That's pretty unbelievable. But it's what happened. She knew right away. She had faith. Look at what the word of God says about Elizabeth and her husband in Luke 1, 6. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. Talking about her and Zechariah. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. Elizabeth walked blamelessly. She lived a holy life. And as you may know, before Christ and his substitutionary death on the cross... Faith was required to be righteous. Faith in God and in his plan. Genesis 15, 6 says, And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Elizabeth had faith. She believed. And this was, again, after generations of no prophet speaking on behalf of God to the people. Theologians, I, I mentioned the 400 years. Theologians often call that time the 400 years of silence. Yet even after 400 years of Jewish people following the Mosaic law, 400 years of their faith being re reduced to a religious duty, Elizabeth's faith remained intact. 
She didn't let her love and her faith grow old or grow cold. She believed. And she was one of the few who didn't miss Christmas. She didn't miss his first coming because she had real faith and she found it. She lived righteously before the Lord. And just like Elizabeth, we need to live with that kind of faith, that special belief that everything in his word declares, that everything the word declares is truth. And to live righteously before God. You know, Romans 3.10 says that there is no one righteous. No, not even one. But as Elizabeth's faith was counted unto her as righteousness under the old covenant, we as new covenant believers must become righteous with a righteousness that is not of ourselves. See, Romans is right. No one can be righteous in and of themselves. But we can be righteous through Christ. His righteousness can become our righteousness. And I want to tell you how good a news that is. Some of you don't get that because it's just like right over your head. I, I want to say that saying again, shoot low sheriff, the riding Shetlands, you know, because it's just going right over the top of you. His righteousness can become your righteousness. And what's so wonderful about that, I mean, that's the essence of the gospel. What's so wonderful about it is, is I know that I can't be good enough in and of myself. I can't be righteous enough to be able to make it to heaven. No one can be good enough to go to heaven. That's why we need Jesus' righteousness to become our righteousness. That means I'm judged by his goodness, not by mine. And I'm all right with that because mine doesn't amount to, to, doesn't amount to anything. Are you hearing me this morning? His righteousness can become ours. And that's a wonderful thing. We become righteous through faith in the cross and the shed blood of our Savior, Jesus. Faith that is sacrificed can be our payment for sin. So we have faith in the cross. We have faith in the blood of Jesus, the shed blood of Jesus for our own righteousness. Elizabeth had faith in God and his plan, and that was counted to her as righteousness. And we can be righteous because of it. You know, every farmer here knows something about faith, don't they? Can you imagine spending money on dried up dead kernels of corn, then going out and burying them in the ground? Spending money on fertilizer and fuel as well to the tune of between $800 and $900 an acre? Then praying that the weather would be right for the dead kernels to grow and to produce a crop that can be harvested for a profit. By the way, science and all of its magnificent discoveries can't really explain how a dried up dead kernel or seed sprouts into new life. They can show you step by step what happens, but you, they can't answer why it happens or how it actually happens. Farmers have faith that it just will and that it will produce enough of a harvest to make a profit. If you're a farmer in here, God bless you, you have faith. And all we need is faith as a mustard seed. If we had as much faith in Christ as an Iowa farmer has in a potential harvest, we'd never, ever end up asking, where are you Christmas? Believe and have faith like Elizabeth. Have faith that his righteousness can become your righteousness. Elizabeth found it. Who else found it? Simeon found it. Simeon. Simeon didn't miss Christmas because he was expecting it. He was always looking for it. He, uh, he, he's not in any of our nativities, if you'll notice, uh, even though he met Jesus before the wise men did. Luke chapter 2, 21 through 24, it says, Eight days later, this is eight days after Jesus was born, when the baby was circumcised, he, named, he was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel even before he was conceived. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. This is probably at least 40 days, a little after 40 days according to Jewish law. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two pigeons. And all these details are so important. They were all a part of him fulfilling the law as a Jew and fulfilling the prophecies that have been spoken of him centuries before he arrived. But Luke 2, 25 through 35, we get into Simeon a little bit. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon as they brought him, Jesus, to present him to the in the temple. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly awaiting. Everybody say, eagerly awaiting. 
He was eagerly awaiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, it says, in verse 26, and had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and he praised God, saying, I mean, upon seeing him, he took the child in his arms and he said, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people Israel. Simeon got it. He found it. He found him. He knew it was Jesus. He knew it was the Messiah right away upon receiving him. And I was just thinking about this. How did he know? If we go on here in verse 33, it says, Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, then he looks at Mary, and he says this, the, who, who was, of course, Jesus' mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. And of course, he was talking to Mary. He was prophesying about what would happen to, to Jesus when he would be put on the cross. It would pierce Mary's heart. It'd break her heart to see her son. How did Simeon know? Well, we know he was righteous and devout and, or dedicated to the Lord. We also just read that he was eagerly awaiting and that the Holy Spirit was upon him. All these contributed to his knowing, to his not missing it. Simeon had been promised by the Holy Spirit that he would not die until he was able to see the Messiah. So he was eagerly awaiting. He was expectant. I know a little something about ex being expectant. As a young kid, I really, really waited, eagerly awaited Christmas. The young kids in here, are you excited about Christmas morning? You going to open some presents Christmas morning? Yeah. When I was your age, I couldn't wait for the presents. And even though we never had an extravagant number of gifts as kids, we always felt blessed. To say that we eagerly awaited Christmas morning would be an understatement. We got up so early on those Christmas mornings, earlier than normal. How many have ever experienced that? Your kids just get up unbelievably. I mean, if you could only get them up for school that early, right? Why is it that you can get up really early when there's Christmas presents and when it's deer hunting season, but you can't get up early any other time. It's hard to get out of bed. It's weird. It's because you're eagerly awaiting something. You're expectant. We never, ever, ever missed those gifts we were so eagerly awaiting for. We were waiting for we got up early and we made sure we got them because we waited for them for so long. And you won't, if, if you, you, you won't find yourself asking, where are you Christmas, if you're waiting and watching for that love, joy, peace, and hope that only Christ can bring to every area of your life. And just as Simeon waited and watched for Jesus' first coming, let's do the same. Let's look for Christ. Let's expect his intervention in every situation of our lives. Let's recognize him when he shows up because we're expectant that he will. And even in his second coming, we ought to be that way, right? Simeon did this for his first advent. We need to do this for his second advent. Simeon didn't miss it. He found it. He found him. He found Christmas. And thirdly, I want to talk about Anna. Anna found him. She found Jesus. She found Christmas. She found it because she was devoted. Luke 2, 36 through 38, Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple at the time when Simeon had taken Jesus into his arms and prophesied over him. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when they had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. 
She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. Anna knew right away when she saw Jesus that it was him, that he was the Messiah. And everyone experiences, I, I want to bring this point out, experiences, everybody experiences difficult things in life. Sometimes those difficult situations make us stronger, and sometimes we allow those tough things to take us down roads that make us struggle. I believe we have choices in this life. We can get better when those kinds of things happen, or we can get bitter. And Anna lost her husband at a very young age. She'd only been married seven years, but instead of living in grief, she decided to live for her Lord. I, I think it's a beautiful story of how Anna responded to something horrific in her life. Nothing wrong with going through grief, don't get me wrong. Going through grief, and, and, and that, that, that takes different people different amounts of time, there's no doubt. But going through grief is different than getting stuck in and living in a state of grief. There's a moving on that must happen. Anna turned to a life of devoted prayer and fasting. It says she hardly ever left the temple. It actually says never left the temple. Never underestimate the power of someone who has given themselves over to prayer. Someone who lives a life of prayer. She knew because she had been in the presence of God. She was devout. She was devoted. Anna recognized when she saw Jesus that she was in the very presence of God because she knew his presence so well. She'd spent a lot of time with him, talking to him and praising him. She'd spent her whole life fasting and praying it also wasn't a chore for her to tell everybody about him. Being devoted to God, like Anna was, devoted to spending time in the word and prayer, devoted to fasting and to personal worship and praise, that will keep you from ever having to ask, where are you Christmas? You will know his presence when you spend time in his presence getting to know him. Have faith, like Elizabeth. Be expectant, like Simeon. Always be looking and be devoted like Anna. And you'll be one of those three less unpopular characteristics within the Christmas story that didn't miss it. You know, I think it's very amazing as you read through the Christmas story and you pull people out and you look at their lives and you look at what they did and what they knew and how they responded to everything that was going on, the greatest event that ever took place in the world. It's amazing to me the masses that missed it and the few that found it. The masses that didn't recognize him, but the few that did. And I don't think that's unlike the scripture that talks about there's a broad way that leads to destruction. And there's a narrow gate that leads to life and few find it. This, this morning, I, I want to challenge every single one of you. Don't miss Christmas this year. You know, it starts by you just asking Jesus into your heart. It starts with you receiving him as your Lord and as your Savior. And I want to lead you in a prayer. And if you've never asked him into your heart today, just pray with me. Pray from your heart. Ask him to, to come in and to take over your life and and. and you know, Jesus take the wheel kind of moment, right? Ask him to come in and be your savior and be your Lord. Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins. Let's do that together. If you bow your heads, I'll, I'll lead you in prayer and you can repeat after me. Lord Jesus, I come before you this morning with all of my sin, all of my shame, my whole life, and I give it to you. Be my savior. Be my Lord. Forgive me of all my wrongdoing. I place you on the throne of my life and ask you to take over. 
I love you, and I want to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that from your heart this morning, the Bible says that you are a new creation in Christ. It seems like something so simple and so easy, but let me tell you, it is something so simple and so easy. Asking him in is the beginning. Walking it out is the rest of your life. Dedicating yourself to him, jumping into the word, spending time talking to him every day. Remember, if you don't want to miss Christmas, take a lesson from Elizabeth, from Simeon, and from Anna. Have faith. That Jesus wants to change your life. That he wants to do something incredible in you. Be expectant like Simeon. Be expectant to see God start blessing and God start doing things in your life that are just amazing. And be like Anna. Be devout. Spend time in his presence. Be devoted to God. Pray. Read his word. Spend time with him. I'm telling you, if you do those three things, you will have the best Christmas you've ever had. We have a service on Christmas Eve this year. And I want to just remind all of you to be at that. It's going to be wonderful. We've got some cool things planned. How many know God's good?